So Uwe, then I will hand over to you. Thank you for being here. The stage is yours. All right. Well, I'm very happy to be here too. And I'm trying to give you an impression about a company which to Laura's impression does everything different than other companies do. And to my impression, we are the normal ones and the other ones are the unnormal ones. So we are basically a drinks producing company. So we produce a cola, which looks pretty minimalistic in design, nothing uh, so fun funky about that. And in regular years, we sell 1.6 million bottles per year. We deliver to 200 cities in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And we have collected 1,700 commercial partners in nearly 19 years of running the company. And we take the company's decisions with everybody which is affected by the company, which might be the first big thing which we do different. And we have collected an online forum, about 260 people in there who take the real big companies' decisions, like strategy, like products, like calculation and costing structures and so on. So we kind of hand over the control about the company's decisions to the people who are actually affected by the company, which is to me the reasonable thing to do and the only thing we, we should do as a company. Why do we do this? Uh, well, um, I do believe that every human being should have the same dignity and should be met, met with respect and cared for properly. And I'm quoting uh, from the Human uh, Rights Charter, the first uh, sentence, all human beings are born free and equity, equal in dignity and rights. And this is something we should do. And this is something which other companies don't do. So in the so-called normal business world, there are two main design faults or construction flaws which have huge consequences, which we want to address in a different fashion. The first design flaw is if you have something, for example, if you have a company or a share, or if you have a position in a company, then you get handed decision-making power over other people and over the usage of resources, just because you have something which I don't understand. Because I, for example, have a company, but this doesn't make me any smarter or wiser or any more qualified or any more entitled to the usage of resources or the usage of power than other people are. So why is just having something enough reason for giving so much power? And the second design flaw I'm seeing is uh, the distribution of wealth, of profits, uh, is also connected to the, the issue of having something. So if I have a company, I can just run it, use my power over other people and resources, and hopefully collect some profits. And then I'm entitled to get these profits all by myself with virtually no limitation at all. And by these two design flaws, we have lots of negative consequences. We do have leaders and owners who misuse their power. We do have uh, the richest 1% of the human population using twice as much pollution, causing twice as much pollution as more than half of the poorest part of the rest of the population, which doesn't make any sense at all to me. So uh, we are kind of destroying the planet we live on as if we had a second one in storage, but we don't. And this is, by, by my understanding, caused by these two design flaws. So if you have something, you can use the power over other people and over resources. And if you have something, you can also use the resources which are generated by everybody else, basically, and by your leading, hopefully, as well, and just collect them and use them for your own personal well-being and for polluting the planet, which doesn't make any sense at all to me. So that's why I try to set up the premium cola company different. Uh, we distributed the decision-making power to everybody who is affected by the company, of course. And we have strong limitations on any profits at all. We don't want to have profits and on the usage of resources as well. I'm going to explain that later on. Right now, we are talking about a company which sells drinks. And we usually sell to cafes and clubs and bars. And we sell to festivals as well. So we had like 95% of our sales coming from these uh, locations, basically locations where people meet. And all these locations were closed down in mid-March. So we experienced a 95% loss of sales, which is pretty tough, uh, as you can imagine. So somebody asked me to slow down. I'm going to slow down a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit excited to share my experience. Okay. 
A 95% loss of sales would mean for most companies a certificate of death. So if so much of your sales uh, go away, then how could you manage possibly as a company to survive this? And we did have some uh, savings. We had savings suitable for three months of uh, regular uh, running the company, which we felt was all right. So we had no pandemic on our radar to, to, to prepare for. And as 95% of sales went away, we were thinking, well, now we have to, I have to take back power. I have to take some hard decisions and cut jobs and postpone payments and uh, reduce production. And I have to take back control because it's necessary to have the company surviving. And luckily I didn't do take back control, but instead I handed over the control again to the people affected. So we were giving the idea, the, the chorus basically, we want to, we need to uh, cut down the company very hard. We need to cut jobs, we need to reduce jobs, we need to postpone payments, we need to postpone productions. But the decision, if we are allowed to do this, are, was handed to the people who, who are affected. So if you had a job with us in mid-March, we would ask you, would you allow us to cut your job or to shorten the hours you work? Or would you allow us to postpone your payment? It's your decision, you decide. And on the other hand, we would also ask you, in this special situation, do you need something upfront? Do you need an upfront production? Do you need an upfront delivery? Do you need an upfront payment? Tell us what you need, you will get it. And while we are doing so on both directions, we make the company small and we make it big at the same time, we distribute and redistribute resources and, and funds from these who have them to those who need them. And while doing so, we, will let, we, will, we won't let anybody down. This was the main cause. We have to make the company small, we have to make it big at the same time, and we won't let anybody down. And this was the cause. So we handed the control and basically the survival of our company to everybody which we work together with. And this includes, of course, not only the people who work directly for us, but also the suppliers, the customers, the trucking companies, the storage houses, everybody who is affected. And I personally, I had the kind of um, um, idea, I, I, I believed that this approach would work, but I didn't expect how well it worked. Uh, after three months, which uh, uh, we had savings for, our bank account had more than tripled in size. So we had nearly 100,000 euros in funds there because so many people uh, gave us basically their funds and they let us redistribute uh, these funds because they trusted us. We had uh, changed every job, including mine, of course. No job stayed the same. And uh, for me personally, I took a part-time job in caring for elderly people. So I went with everybody and moved and uh, got into action. Uh, then we um, experienced that many people uh, get, got into personal development. For example, we had people who were unreliable before and they came up with the idea to, became, to become more reliable. We had people who were very shy before and used me as their spokesperson to care for problems which they had with other people. And they came up and asked uh, to do this themselves. And we had people who uh, very much liked the idea to be given tasks and explain tasks to them. And they came up front and uh, argued they want to uh, write their tasks themselves. So we had lots of personal development as well in this crisis. What we didn't have, and which is basically my main success factor <laughs> to, to boast a little, is the absence of problems. We didn't have any fights. We didn't have any lawsuits. We didn't have to force anybody to do something. It all went peacefully, which I think is astonishing because the, this is a life-threatening crisis for our company. This is on, for many people on a personal level, it's a, it's a very threatening situation. And also for me, uh, I built up this company with everybody else for more than nearly 19 years. And I felt pretty much uh, stunned by this development uh, as well. And I was personally scared that I can't make a living anymore. So this was a tough situation. And still we went to not only surviving it, but surviving it pretty well, changing every job involved and having no fights, no problems, no, um, no lawsuits at all. 
of course, we had discussions about the right thing to do, but there was no, uh, yeah, no arguing, no fighting. It went all very peacefully, which I think it's uh, it's crazy, to be honest. And um, the question, of course, is why am I telling this in the beginning? Why did this work out so well? What did we do before so to to fuel a company culture which is was able to sustain this crisis so well? I explained in the very beginning that I care about these two design flaws in the uh, usual industry. So the distribution of power and the distribution of, uh, of resources and wealth. And concerning power, from the very beginning of the company, uh, we asked everybody who is affected by us, so the people who work for us, the suppliers, the customers, the neighbors, everybody who is affected by us, to join an online forum and talk about every issue they might have there and we issued the right to veto to anybody. So we need a consensus to take any company decision. And anybody who is involved can join this online forum and give their veto there. So if we want to come up with a decision, we need to care for everybody's needs and ideas and wishes and thoughts so well that nobody feels the need to issue a veto. So the company is not about caring for me and generating an income for me. But instead, it's about caring for everybody else. And if we do this well enough, then we can move forward and come to decisions, and then we can produce some drinks. But the drinks are just the byproduct, uh, to be honest, of the actual purpose of the company, which is to care for everybody. And the consensus decision-making decision is typically met with three prejudices. So I'm going to explain these to you uh, uh, <clears throat> if you have them. The first prejudice is if you need consensus, the discussion takes ages. You always have to talk and talk and talk and you have to meet and it takes hours and hours and you can't come, can't come to quick decisions, which is kind of true. Of course, it takes a little longer to discuss things uh, instead of just deciding them on my own. But if we invite everybody to co-decide, then everybody co-decided and gave their knowledge and ideas and wisdom uh, to the process. So the quality of decisions is much better than just one person deciding. And also they had the experience that they were allowed to co-decide. So the execution of the decision later on is met with less, um, less problems. It's it get executed better. And so we have, of course, in the beginning to take a little longer discussions than just one person deciding, but then we would save time on midterm and long-term because we avoid problems. Uh, second prejudice on consensus is if everybody can veto any uh, decision, then you always have vetoes and you can move forward with the company, which to our experience is not true. And I think this depends on the approach which we try to use when we deal with people. If we would be a standard employer, we would kind of give a job description, then we would ask people to, to apply, then we would ask for resumes and check their, their um, previous uh, diplomas and so on and then we give them the work to do, and then we assign goals to them, and we check these goals, and we use sanctions, and we use rewards, and we are kind of moving from a top-down position and um, using our, our power over, pe over people. And if we do so, we kind of cause a negative relationship uh, on, the, uh, on the people we work with. And if we don't do all these things, if we just let everybody try any job they want to try, and if we don't control their results and if we don't you know, survey them with cameras and if we have them decide what they want to work and how they want to work and how long they want to work and where, of course, then we co are causing a more positive relationship and then we will have less problems with people, of course. Who of you would not like to be treated with dignity and respect? Most of you, I guess. And I still guess most of you will then reply in a, different, in a, in a similar fashion. So, if we uh, if we approach people in a basically uh, on eye level, then we basically need uh, we basically get uh, reactions on eye level too. And sometimes I imagine if more companies or all companies would do so, in what kind of business world, in what kind of society we could be living, if the most companies wouldn't use their power from the, the top down but just work on eye level. Could be an insanely positive world, I guess, but unfortunately we don't have it. Uh, the third uh, prejudice uh, towards consensus democracy 
uh, typically is that if you talk to everybody, you get the smallest possible compromise. So the easiest solution uh, and not the toughest uh, solution, which again, I cannot confirm. Uh, for example, the course to make the company big and small and not, not let anybody down is uh, not the smallest uh, possible consensus, but it's basically the pretty radical approach to hand the control over the company's survival in the hands of everybody affected. So this is uh, not the smallest possible compromise. And we have been working with this model by consensus decision-making for nearly 19 years now. And of course, the model is not perfect. We had three incidents where we couldn't reach a consensus, but we had to decide. The first two incidents were about matters of taste. We couldn't agree on an art picture of the backside of the labels, which we had to because we needed to produce labels and bottles. The second uh, issue was we couldn't agree on a line of text on the front side of the labels. So uh, I was allowed to give a decision so we could move forward with the company. And the third incident was a production mistake. We had the double amount of caffeine in the bottles which is great because we already have the la largest amount of caffeine, which is allowed, but it's illegal to have the double amount. So we need to retract these bottles immediately from the market. And that's what I was allowed to decide. So three times in nearly 19 years, we had to have the owner take a decision, but it's only three times. So once in six years, we need uh, the owner to give a decision, which is great, I guess. It's only once in six years. And in the meantime, we didn't have to uh, uh, rely on single person's decisions, which I think is great. And in all these years, we also avoided to have written contracts with everybody involved. So there is no written contract involved in the drinks production, in the delivery, in the invoicing and so on, no written contract. And also we declared every agreement we, we find to be temporarily only. So we agreed on something and the agreement takes in place uh, stays in place until somebody disagrees and wants to talk about it. And this is exactly the right moment to do it because if you don't, you will have an unhappy person on the other end and with unhappy persons, you get more problems, of course. So we need to make every agreement temporarily and renegotiate when somebody feels it's necessary. And by doing so, we have the, the largest percentage um, of happy people basically in the structure which I can prove with, again, a success um, a factor. We also didn't have any lawsuits at all in all these years of running the company, just zero, the absence of problems. So we had 1,700 commercial partners in more than 19 years without a written contract, everything is temporarily, and we didn't have any lawsuit at all. So this is the absence of problems I'm actually pretty proud of. And uh, I'd like you to show me a company which uh, is in, into business so many years with so many partners, which managed to do this. Uh, so I think this is actually um, a great result. And um, this approach to uh, handing the control over to the others is of course one reason why the reaction to COVID-19 worked so well, because the people were used to it. And we uh, promised to them the years before that we use the decisions uh, in, in that we take decisions in, in a group and not on ourselves or just for our personal advantage. And with the second uh, design flaw I was pointing out, the distribution of, uh, of wealth and uh, resources, we of course came up with a different salary model than other companies have. Uh, if we feel that every human being is born with the same equal dignity, then we shouldn't kind of value different jobs with different salary, but we should kind of care for people's needs basically. So we discussed 32 factors, which we could take into account by uh, determining salaries. And we of course found out about factors like, uh, um, um, like education, for example. If you have a good education, then you might get more money in other companies. But if you do the boring jobs or the dirty jobs or the dangerous jobs with truck driving, for example, then you maybe should get more money for that. So we discussed and discussed and it turned out that we don't want to use different salaries for different jobs, but we want to have the same hourly salary for every job we, uh, we actually have. But there are of course factors which we cannot deny and these factors uh, re result from personal needs. For example, if you have kids, you need more money to feed the kids. So if you have kids, you will get a, high, a higher salary per kid from us. If you have parents which are getting older and you have to care for them, 
then of course you get more money for caring for these parents to have less um, um, hours to work because you need more time or more money or both to care for your parents. So you get a rise if you care for um, any relative, uh, it, then you will get a rise from us. If you have a personal handicap, then you will get more money for this personal handicap for us. And if you need a desk somewhere, because uh, even before COVID-19, we didn't have any office. So it's all remote work. So we didn't have to change on that one. And um, if you need a desk, of course, you need to make room at your home or you need to rent a desk somewhere. So you get more money for this desk workplace and that's it. So there are people in our company which earn more money than I do because they have a handicap or they have parents to care for, which I don't. And this is perfectly all right because they need more money and I don't. And the question of money is of course related to personal happiness for most people. And most people actually think that more money makes you happier all the time. So many, many people are after more money all the time. And I can confirm because uh, if you have not enough money, if your income is insufficient to care for your work, living place, for your, um, for your food and for your security and for your hobbies, then more money will make you happier because it gets you rid of problems. But if your living environment is paid for and the fridge is full and you have all insurances and you have a third bike and you have been on holidays and then what do you want to do with more money? So the relation between happiness and money is kind of tough if you don't have enough money, of course, then more money will make you happier. But if everything is paid for, then even more money doesn't make you so much more happier. And there are several studies about this that there is actually a cap. Uh, determining from the study from 30 to 60 thousand dollars per year even if you throw lots of money on people uh, beyond that they won't get any happier so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to have more money all the time you need sufficient income and that's it and i think this is also um, true on society level uh, i would like the idea to have a sufficient income for everybody no matter if they are doing uh, work which is paid or doing other work for example, care work for, for children or doing your household also work. So you still need an income. So we need a basic income for everybody, which can't be uh, too, uh, too small, so a sufficient income. And on the other hand, we need a maximum income because it doesn't make any sense for somebody to earn millions. What for? Just for polluting the environment and to harm others in the process doesn't make sense. So we need a maximum income uh, for people as well. And depending on the theory, this maximum income can be triple the size than the basic income or maybe 10 times the size maybe if you wish but then basically it, it's enough what's the reason to have 11 times more money than anybody else doesn't make you any happier unless you don't compare but the problem with comparison is if my neighbor for example has more money than i do or has a bigger house or has a, i don't know more bikes uh, then i'm uh, it's the same for me so i'm not um, better off uh, no, I forgot, I explained it. Um, if my neighbor has a better life than I do, my life actually didn't change. So it doesn't make sense to compare, but it just makes sense to, to care for their, for their personal needs and ideas and um, the personal wishes. And if I am, I'm able to meet them with sufficient income, then it's enough. And also money is just one aspect of the story if, you, if we talk about personal income or salary. We have determined at least seven factors which play a role. First one, of course, is money. We do need sufficient money, but that's it. The second one is the safety of this income. If I have a very high salary, but it's unstable, then it doesn't make so much sense to me than to have a smaller one, which is more stable. So safety, stability is an issue. Then I think freedom is an issue. If I have somebody telling me what to do and when and where and how, then it's a low level of freedom. And if I can decide on this for my own, then it's a better level of freedom. Uh, fourth uh, aspect might be uh, a reason. I'm trying to do a reasonable job in this world and help people and establish a different form of running a company, which makes sense in, on a society level. And instead, I could also be selling cigarettes or something and make more money by it. But then the, the reason factor would be missing, for me at least. Uh, the fifth factor might be personal development. I can learn new things all the time. I can talk about new things all the time. I can meet new people all the time compared to a job where I might be stuck for several years and have virtual few, a little room for personal development. 
And the sixth aspect might be uh, personal reach for a change in society. I'm invited here for the 17th time now I learned today. So I have reached quite some students with my ideas and this is great and I love it. So this is personal reach, which I wouldn't be having in, in other uh, work relations. And also the seventh aspect, which I didn't realize uh, several years, uh, I can just be one person by myself and uh, say the same things to you than I would say to other people. So I don't have to kind of um, wear a suit and uh, keep my mouth shut and do what I'm told in other work relations. I actually had an offer for working at a big company in Frankfurt. They asked me to do personal development for their employees and they offered me 20,000 uh, euros per month. And I declined because I would only have uh, been given more on the first salary factor, but there are seven. And if I uh, look at all the others, then I would have to take back my personal freedom, take back on security, take back on reach, take back on uh, freedom and so on, uh, just to have more money, which doesn't make sense if the money is sufficient. So what I'm talking about here is virtually a different, maybe approach to life basically, because I don't need much more money all the time, just I need enough money. But what I do need is of course, um, a, a personal work relation which fuels all this and every group every collective we have met so far kind of has key persons and maybe I'm a key person with our collective and I'm trying to um, to use this key role and maybe be a leader the world is very much frowned upon in our collective but I kind of lead this with uh, three uh, tasks I'm trying to do there and maybe you can take something from these tasks. The first thing I'm trying to do is to give a very precise orientation to the group what we actually want to do. And the orientation is we want to have the same equal dignity for all human beings in the business world and in the world in general. This is something I personally cannot discuss because I feel there is no human being with less dignity than other human beings. We cannot discuss human dignity. Uh, so. So to say, so this is something we can use as an orientation and as a reference point to come back to if we have to decide upon something. So if we discuss, we can always use this, this question, which solution would be best to, to reach the most basic human dignity for everybody affected by this decision? And this is something I'm trying to offer. And if you want to work with us, you kind of have to agree to this key orientation that every human being has the same equal dignity. And this is something if you don't agree, if you vote for a German AFD Nazi party or something, if you feel you are a better person, if you have bright colored skin or if you are a male, you're better, then we will get into trouble for, for sure. But if you feel the key orientation is, uh, is all right, then we can move forward from there. The second role I have in uh, my, key, um, uh, my, my key function is to offer a huge safe space where everybody can give their uh, opinion freely, where everybody can, cho can choose their job freely, and where nobody has to be afraid of getting fired uh, because they make mistakes, because they work slow, because they disagree, because they are getting on my nerves, because they're getting sick, or all of the things combined. This needs to be safe to be fired from, unless you try to um, re uh, deliberately try to do damage to our company. If you try to do damage to our company deliberately, not by making a mistake, then you can get nominated for getting fired by anybody. And then you can still co-discuss your own firing process, but your veto wouldn't count. And that's the only thing which we take from you if, you, if we nominate you from, uh, for getting fired. Which in turn means that every other pe person involved, 259 people right now, still have the right to veto. So if you want to get fired from us, it's pretty tough. You have to... Uh, try to do damage to us deliberately, get nominated by somebody, and then behave so badly that nobody else feels that we could work with you uh, any further. And we only had two incidents of this kind in nearly 19 years of running the company, because what I at least think, we try to meet everybody with equal dignity and respect and care for them. And then we cause much less problems with people than we would have in a standard business um, fashion. And this safe space actually is needed for everybody to give their opinion freely and to talk and to choose their jobs and so on. And the third function I have as a key person is to act when it's absolutely necessary. 
I was telling you about this three incidents we had when you couldn't reach a consensus. So the first two times we couldn't move, basically, we couldn't produce labels and we had to, so somebody had to do something about it. And this was actually my role there. Uh, with the third incident, when we had the misproduction with the double caffeine, somebody had to take action and this was supposed to be me. And maybe this reaction to Corona, uh, to COVID-19 was also kind of my key role. Uh, I was expected to suggest the right course. And the people in the collective would very carefully listen to what I have to say, but they won't obey. And this is exactly the way it should be, I guess. Uh, so we can move forward and still I don't get too much power, which I wouldn't want to have anyway. So last chapter of my talk would be about how could you transfer this maybe to some of you pretty radical ideas to other companies and other industries. And we were invited to do so. And we met more than 60 other groups or companies which we uh, are allowed to have, were allowed to have. And these groups were very different in size and in goals and in the people who, who they consisted of. We were invited to a collective who have built themselves a ship to do parties on in Hamburg, which is great. We were also invited to smaller companies, to big companies like Deutsche Bahn, for example, the German national railway provider. And I was also invited to the government of the United Arabian Emirates, which was, was a fun experience. And we, of course, found different problems and different uh, tasks in every group. And there were three aspects which were the same in every group we met. And I'm going to tell you about these because maybe you can use them in your uh, later work uh, environment. The potential for change, or the, the huge potential for change, typically lies in the exchange between the people affected. Good companies try to exchange between their leaders and the people who work there, or between the colleagues, or the, the areas of the company. This is our good companies, but that's not enough. Virtually all companies have effects on other companies or on their competitors or on their neighbors or on their suppliers or on their customers. So the huge potential for change typically uh, hides in the exchange between the people affected. They are, there are the potentials hidden. So if you want to fuel change, then you need to fuel the exchange between the people affected. The second time, the uh, second thing, unfortunately, which is also true in all companies we've met, if you want to change a given company, it takes an awful lot of time. And the bigger a company is, and the more fragmented it is, and the older a company typically is, the longer time changes take, unfortunately. And you have to determine if you work for a company, is this company still able to change, or is it maybe too old and too fragmented and too big to actually change? I was invited, invited to German car makers as well. And at one car maker, we talked about they need to stop uh, uh, producing uh, fossil fuel burning cars. They need to just stop. Didn't you read the news? You have to stop. And they were like, well, we, we know, but we need like 20 years for such a change. And I was like, well, we don't have 20 years. We need, we need to stop right now. We need to change. And they were like, we can't. And then it kind of slipped out of me. So we have to close down the company. It's broken. We cannot sustain it anymore. And of course, they were arguing they can't and they are pretty important for the environment and this and that. And well, of course, this is a big company. It's very important, but uh, it's not as important as the planet we live on. So to be honest, this is more important. We need to close down the company. So if you make me a chancellor of Deutschland, then I would just close down these companies, which we need to change, but they can't. And they are just uh, too big and they take too much time. But unfortunately, change in companies takes time. And the third aspect, which is also the same in every group we visited, is a little, well, hack, a little trick how you can actually do it. You can keep the given structure of the company. In some cases, it's actually good not to change anything on a formal scale, because formal changes cause maybe anxiety, cause, um, cause even a revolution that might cause problems. But if you keep the company as it is on a formal scale, but still give yourself the, the goal to almost never use this formal structure, then you can have the best from both worlds. You can do everything else, use consensus, use consent, use majority votes, use all kinds of methods, use uh, agile methods, you name it, anything is possible there. And if things don't work out, you can still use the formal structure you have to get things going again or to, to intervene. So if you have a given structure, then you can choose to keep it. 
but give yourself the goal to almost never use it. And that's what we have learned from other groups and other industries and other companies, how you can possibly fuel change. So I might be done with my talk right now and be open to questions. And if we have like a half an hour left, maybe you have some questions. I do have some content uh, on experience in the uh, logistics industry, for example. We've been there and uh, changed things. I have some experience in house administration as well. We've been there and changed things. But uh, right now, I would prefer to open up the talk for your questions. And I'm pretty curious uh, about the questions you have. 